Hey everybody, this is Mr. Lidke. Today we're going to be uh, talking about how we can use the diversity of corn and dog breeds that have been produced through artificial selection <clears throat> as evidence that natural selection uh, could create the diversity of life that we see on earth today. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and push the um, get the slideshow going here. Okay, um, <clears throat> so if we look at modern corn today, uh, it looks nothing like the ancestral variety uh, of corn from which it came. So the ancestral corn is actually Teosinte. So of course we would want to be able to explain like how did this happen? Um, <clears throat> okay, so first of all, artificial selection is when humans are selecting for certain characteristics that we feel are beneficial. So we continually pick those individuals with the characteristics that we like to make them reproduce together, and we get more of that variety in the future. So if we look at uh, the case of corn and teosinte here, so... <clears throat> One of the components of Darwin's theory of natural selection is that there is variation in the population. So the same thing would have been true for variation within the Teosinte population. Some Teosinte individuals would have produced like bigger ears than other individuals. And if you're a hungry Mayan, who would you pick to reproduce? Yeah, me too. I would pick um, the teosinte that produced the biggest ears and I would use that to plant my crop for the next year and that's exactly what happened generation after generation year after year of doing that eventually has led to uh, modern corn which has huge ears of corn much bigger than uh, the ears that teosinte had Okay, so if we look at this, this is a cladogram, which is an important thing. <clears throat> so first of all, if we look at this line right here is the today line. Okay, and if we start to go back down this way, what we're doing is we are going back in time. So sweet corn and field corn are around today. But if we start going back in time and we start going down here, Eventually, we are going to come to a point in time when sweet corn and field corn uh, did not exist, that there was this teosinte variety. Okay, and another misconception is, is that, all right, you know, the individual that is here evolved into this one. No, that's not the way it works. Okay, if we go back in time, neither of these two existed, only this variety existed. And we'll deal with that idea a little bit more uh, in the future, but... Okay, so another example is there are breeds of dogs called terriers. Uh, they're a great example. Um, <clears throat> so these, these terriers uh, originated in England. So if we look at the dates that are in parentheses, those are the dates that the American Kennel Club uh, officially designated them as a distinct breed. Uh, okay, so here's, you know, the bull terrier, uh, and we'll look at these pictures more on a, an upcoming slide. All right, so these breeds of terriers originated in the United States, uh, a couple of varieties of rat terriers. Uh, so then there's some, the terriers that originated in Ireland. So there's two right here, and then here's another variety that originated in I Ireland. Okay, and then these two varieties of terriers originated in Australia. Okay, so here is another cladogram. And if we look at this, the main concept here is that we can trace all of these varieties of terriers back to one ancestral ver variety of terrier. Okay, and again, like if we start to go back in time... <clears throat> Eventually, we are going to hit a point in time when there was not all of these, there was only one variety. Okay, another idea that's really important here is 
is that if we look at the isolated locations, so the varieties of terriers that uh, originated in Ireland, they have certain characteristics and the varieties that originated in Britain have similar characteristics but slightly different. Same deal for the American Terriers and also a same deal for the Terriers that originated in Australia. As a major idea is that if we look at varieties in different locations they will have similarities and they will have differences and we can see that with our Terriers. Okay, the other interesting thing is, is that um, the, the hairless terrier here, we know exactly when this point was. Uh, there was actually a, a batch that was born in the United States in 1972, and that was like a mutation occurred which introduced the first, uh, the first batch of hairless terriers, okay? So, yeah, like if we go back to like right here, you know, 1971, there was not two varieties, there was only the one variety, and that these two have descended from this one. And if we keep going back in time, yes, eventually all of these varieties can be traced back to one ancestral terrier variety. Okay, um, so I'm not actually going to talk about this slide. You should look at the presentation at this link and you should um, look at this. But this is a model answer for using um, the key phrases as how evolution may have occurred. Okay, um, but I don't want this video to be too long, so you can look at that by yourself. Uh, all right. So now, the next thing here is, like, we just dealt with terriers, okay? So here's another example of a cladogram. Like we said, all of these terriers, we eventually we can trace back to one ancestral terrier variety. But of course, there are more varieties of dogs that are out there, okay? So if we start going back in time, this one would be the variety of dog that we can trace all of these back to. Okay, and if we keep going back in time, back in time, back in time, eventually we get to the first ancestral dog variety that we can trace back all modern dogs to. That is a major idea. <clears throat> and, of course, evolutionary biologists would pose the question, if this diversity of terriers can be created over 150 years, well, what if we gave natural selection 150,000 years? Or what if we gave natural selection 100, and, or I'm sorry, 1.5 million years? How many varieties could be produced? <clears throat> okay, and the answer is, yeah, I mean, at some point in time, we would expect that we would be able to trace all canines back to one original canine variety. So, like, we were just talking about dogs right there. That's where they would be. Well, if we start going back in time, eventually there is going to be a point in time where dogs and gray wolves shared a common ancestor, okay? And if we start going back in time, okay, well, this would be the ancestor to dogs, gray wolves, and coyotes. This, I wish my m cursor would stay on the screen here, but uh, this variety, but... It, yeah, I mean, if we keep going back, 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 eventually we are going to come to a point in time where we can trace all canines back to this. So, uh, yeah, you know, like the, like the slide is saying here, you know, is it really ridiculous to think that organisms could descend from a common ancestor and then not be able to mate? So, here we have a Great Dane, there we have a Chihuahua. And I'm going to let your imagination run wild with that, but, hmm, how good do you think the mating would work between these two varieties of dogs? Alright, uh, so... Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Make sure you read the article about Great Danes and dogs and do the assignment, or Great Danes and Chihuahuas, do the assignment. Uh, thank you.